The last page has been turned on my most recent read and for the first time in a while I'm actually talking about a book I have just finished. It's fresh in my mind and I am really looking forward to telling you all about it. So here I am, no spoilers, as opinion filled as ever and ready to roll. All of which means it's time for the latest episode of Being Bookish. Join me today as I travel through the Vale and visit mortal Shanghai in the 1930s with a half-vampire, half-Holy Ching, who wants to experience the world and figure out where she belongs. I told myself that I was going to review something other than fantasy this week, but I read Shanghai Immortal by A.Y. Chow and knew that I just had to share. I'm your host, Ray, self-confessed bookworm, introvert, hermit, long-term depression sufferer, and ex-coffee addict. Join me on my journey through my ever-growing to-be-read pile, and enjoy the latest of my 100% spoiler-free book reviews. As I've already mentioned, I told myself that I was going to stay away from the fantasy, at least for a little while. But as I approached the end of a non-existent UK summer, seriously, what the heck is wrong with this? I wanted to read something that made me happy. After a few moments of consideration, well, actually, it was probably closer to an hour, I decided to pick up Shanghai Immortal, and ignoring a few very enjoyable interruptions that included going out for coffee, the start of an exciting new project, and getting my hair done, I finally found myself pulled into Lady Jing's life. And I apologise now if I pronounce any names or words incorrectly, I do not speak Chinese. Pawned by her mother to the king of hell as a child, Lady Ching is half vampire, half holy Ching, fox spirit, and all sass hole. As the king's ward, she has spent the past 90 years running errands, dodging the taunts of the spiteful holy Ching courtiers and trying to control her explosive temper with varying levels of success. So when Ching overhears the courtiers plotting to steal a priceless dragon pearl from the king, she seizes her chance to expose them once and for all. With the help of a gentle mortal tasked with setting up the central bank of hell, Ching embarks on a wild chase for intel, first through hell and then through mortal Shanghai. But when her hijinks put the mortal in danger, she must decide which is more important, avenging her loss of face or letting go of her half-empty approach to life for a chance to experience tenderness and maybe even love. The book starts with us meeting our lead protagonist, Lady Jing. She is 99 years old and occasionally carries out specific tasks for her guardian, Big Wang the King of Hell, which has been modelled after the modern city of Shanghai, or at least Shanghai, in the 1930s. Lady Ching is something of a rebel, pushing everyone to their limits and enjoying every moment of it. If she can annoy her guardian and his two companions, then she is happy, whether it's through showing them her underwear or acting in an unladylike manner, which is more unladylike than showing her underwear, unbecoming a woman of her station. Despite the fact that she has been brought up in hell, she is the daughter of a celestial and the granddaughter of the most powerful Holy Jing, or Fox Spirit. Unfortunately for Lady Ching, she was born to the daughter of Niang Niang and a vampire, making her a half-breed or mongrel, someone to be looked down upon. Her grandmother and the courtiers of the Holy Jing court made no bones of the fact that they would rather see Lady Jing put down than have her in a position of power. Lady Jing spent her entire life believing that she was so unwanted that her mother sold her to the ruler of hell in order to buy a canary diamond and then conveniently died and nothing anyone says since has done anything to convince her differently. Lady Ching is almost horrified to realise that her errand for her guardian involves picking up a human and taking him to meet with Big Wang, who has plans to open banks in hell. 
Not only is this human, Mr. Lee, trouble from the moment he arrives, but he is also in possession of a fake medallion, a lei, that is meant to protect his yang from being stolen by any of the multitude of demons and celestials that roam the realm freely. While she is doing her best to protect her charge from being eaten, Lady Ching overhears her grandmother's favourite courtier plotting against Big Wang and his plans, as well as planning to steal the long new dragon pearl that everyone believes Jing's mother stole from the Holy Jing Palace. Lady Ching does her best to persuade her guardian of what she has overheard, and even with Mr. Lee backing up her claims, she is unable to convince him that she is telling the truth. This leads to us witnessing one of her juvenile tantrums before she runs back to her rooms for sanctuary. After it's discovered that someone in mortal Shanghai was sending Mr. Lee to his potential death with a fake lei, Big Wang sends Lady Ching to the other side of the veil. Though it appears he is sending her initially to find out who has been plotting against him and his plans for a bank, something that is no doubt 100% frustrating to Lady Ching, as she has already tried to tell him what she overheard. There is another motive behind his actions, which doesn't become clear until the end of the book. And as you know, that qualifies as a spoiler, so I am not going to say anything. The sights and sounds in Mortal Shanghai are somewhat overwhelming to Lady Ching, who has never been around so many with blood and yang pumping through their veins. She is experiencing all the things she has dreamed about. Sunset, food with such incredible flavour and aroma, the stars. Beauty she has painted and seen in her dreams, but doesn't remember from her few childhood years living in the mortal realm. Mr. Lee is in his element, showing this lovely woman around a place he is so familiar with, and as they are touring the city, they start to grow closer. After a night of drinking and fun, Mr. Lee and Lady Jing return to their hotel, discover that Lady G, the daughter of the Jade Emperor, who has been banished to hell for ig ignoring her responsibilities for love, has arrived with her lover, Lang. Gigi tells Jing that she has been sent to ensure that the younger woman has fun while she is in Shanghai, something that Jing is incredibly suspicious of because why would anyone care if she is having fun or enjoying herself when they don't actually care about her at all? Jing is so perplexed by the arrival of Lang and Gigi that she is put a little bit off balance but this leads to her opening up and acknowledging that perhaps she isn't quite as disliked by everyone as she initially believed. Of course it's not all wine and roses and when after a disagreement with Mr. Lee who she is opening up to and therefore feels vulnerable she runs away as she tends to do when she doesn't want to confront her fears. She realizes that she is being followed and is dragged into the middle of a battle that has been going on since she was a child. To escape, she has to face the woman who has wanted her dead since birth, and stand up for herself and everyone that she cares about. I wasn't sure what to expect from this novel. It was actually an impulse purchase after I saw the beautiful teals and oranges that were all over the dust jacket. Such a beautiful cover, of course, doesn't always mean that the book is going to be amazing, but I am ever hopeful. So having not been lucky enough to be on the fairy loot list, I ended up buying my copy from Waterstones and added the book to my ever-growing collection. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that bit later. I have to be honest, I am never sure what the divide is when it comes to fantasy and the definitions of young adult, new adult and adult, forever now going to be referred to as YA, NA and adult, because I think that A would get a bit confusing. It seems to be an incredibly blurry line. Where books are concerned, the age rating doesn't truly exist. I have to be honest, I don't ever recall being told that I wasn't able to purchase a Stephen King novel, despite the content clearly being unsuitable for a 10-year-old. Okay, booksellers and librarians did give me a bit of side-eye occasionally, but they never stopped me from leaving with the books that I picked up. 
But anyway, Shanghai Immortal is marketed as an adult fantasy, though I did see little to differentiate this from some of the YA and NA fantasies I have read over the last few months. The summary is what pulled me in when I finally picked the book off the shelf, and the part comedic and part tragic storyline is what kept me enthralled when I turned to the last page. Apart from scanning the barcode into Goodreads, oh, I do love that tool, to better track my reading habits, I didn't actually check for any reviews, though I know it's easy to fall into that trap of looking to see what other people think of a book or anything else, and then trusting their view rather than my own or your own instincts. I always say the same when talking about reviews, even my own. No matter what other people think about a book, including me, you should make up your own mind. If it's an author you like or a genre you enjoy, ignore the negative reviews and opinions. I like to make up my own mind about things, even if everything I've seen is really negative or, on the other hand, incredibly positive because overhyped content can be seen as a negative thing. I don't know why, but it can. I have read some books in the past, um, the, the, the Mister being one of them, that may, that possibly could have made my eyes bleed because they were so bad. But I know plenty of people that enjoyed it. And I want to be able to figure these things out for myself. So if that means putting myself through a bit of mental trauma in order to find out, then I'm going to do it. Of course, if you are looking at the reviews to learn more about the content and whether the book is one that contains themes that cause you emotional or mental trauma, then that is totally different. You need to know if there are specific things that trigger you and you don't want to read a book because of that, then you need to know. I wish there were an easier way that didn't include trigger warnings at the front of a book because if you've got that far, it's a bit late. If there is anything that reinforces the whole everyone is different statement, then it is definitely reviews, whether they're for books, TV or anything else. Everyone has an opinion and everyone is entitled to one. As always, I want to give you a balanced perspective because hearing views from both ends of the spectrum is important. Sure, I may not share them and they may have found something entirely different in a book when they read it, but that doesn't make their opinion or mine any less valid. This is how they felt about it and it's personal. Of course, as I always say, don't let any of the re these reviews, including mine, sway you. To quote Casey Mulgrave, follow your arrow. It won't lead you wrong and if it does, it's a learning experience. Cam gave Shanghai Immortal one star and it seems that a lot of the issues she had with the book were related to the language used, not foul language, I, I will stress, just overuse of specific words. She said, This was a really hard read and I don't even mean this in terms of the plot. Jing's character was so frustrating to read because of how immature and reckless she is. This book is advertised as an adult book, but I really think this should have been YA, even maybe middle grade, with the repetitive piss farts and tartars and the tantrums and immense whining from Jing about being treated like a child. I was really struggling with getting through the book. Her character was too juvenile. I also understand the author's intention in wanting to create a Shanghai setting, but it was almost jarring having to pause and consider the language because it doesn't really get explained. And had I not already known some of the language, it would have been a much harder read for me. And Jing's character didn't help with the flow of the story at all. I'm also not really sure I understood the plot of the book. I was very distracted by Jing. And it wasn't until I was past the halfway mark when I felt like the story really picked up. Honestly, I really wasn't a fan of any of the characters, and I thought the romance was awkward and forced, especially since there was no build-up. I think the ideas in this book were very interesting, but the execution fell short, and I could see the attempts at humour. Ultimately, with all the repetition and lack of growth and development in both the plot and characters, 
Unfortunately, this book is not for me. Cam, as with many of the other reviewers who felt the book was only worth one star, found that the decision to classify this novel as adult fantasy rather than YA was a little deceptive. And while I don't have as much of an issue with this particular decision as others, I can see where she and the others are coming from. But as I already mentioned earlier, I am not sure where the definitions truly split. Is it to do with language or content or a combination of the two? Is there a specific definition available somewhere that I'm not aware of? This is a question I asked myself only a week ago when I received my first adult fantasy box from Fairy Loot and contained within it was a definite YA novel in the form of Forged by Blood. Everything about that book from the cover to the description screams written primarily for a teenage audience, yet Fairy Loot had stuck it in the adult box. Go figure. As I record this, there are 1,130 ratings precisely and 492 fully written reviews for Shanghai Immortal on Goodreads. 51%, so just over half, are on the positive end of the spectrum being four and five stars. However, 33% of reviewers awarded it the average of three stars and 16% of readers felt it was a book worth only one or two stars in rating which is higher than usual, at least for the books I have been talking about over the last few years. Shanghai Immortal is currently listed as the first in a series, with the second book listed as untitled at present, though due for release in June of 2024. This book was released on the 1st of June 2023, and despite the fact that it hasn't attracted as many reviews as other fantasy novels released around the same time... <clears throat> fourth wing <clears throat> there is still plenty of time for that to change it will be interesting to see what other people think as more work their way through what are no doubt excessively large tbr piles exactly like my own overall the book has a score of 3.5 out of 5 on goodreads which admittedly surprised me given how popular this genre has become, and it has dragons on the cover. However, it was released at a time when a glut of fantasy hit the shelves, so it's possible it has yet to find its audience. And checking through the reviews, it's obvious that many of them had read NetGalley proofs, though this won't make a difference to the end result, really. Despite the fact that this book is most definitely a fantasy with mythological influences, it doesn't appear to have attracted as many hate readers or the extended meme-laden reviews that so often accompany this particular genre. As ever, there were quite a few one-star reviews left by people who had DNF'd the book quite early on, with several abandoning hope at less than 20%. One even admitted they had DNF'd at 8%. So I feel that marking the book as one star was perhaps a little unfair. But as with everything, that's my personal view. I don't think I will ever sit here and say, I think that if you DNF a book really early on, you should rate a book one star, no matter the reason you didn't finish it. But as always, opinions are very personal and therefore you do you. Everyone is entitled to review and feel how they want about something, as long as no one gets hurt. I just happen to think that DNFing early and giving a book a low rating is a little bit unfair. I've DNFed plenty that I've DNFed very early on and I don't give them anything. In fact, I don't even record that I've read them. I did find it interesting that, as with so many negative reviews, a considerable number of people seem to share the same or similar view. They found specific behaviours of Lady Ching to be problematic and the use of certain terms that she was constantly flinging out to be more suitable for a book aimed at a much younger audience. So was the problem that it was marketed as adult and should have been YA? When it comes to picking a book for yourself, it's always worth looking at more than one review though, especially if you're not sure. Though, to be honest, I personally would ask a friend first – because they are more likely to know what you like, though not necessarily actually like the same things as you. I don't have many friends who will sit there and say, I read every book that you've read. 
When it comes to positive reviews, there were quite a few five-star ones to choose from, though none were illustrated in a way that I have grown rather used to. There were a number that definitely met the requirements my uni had for assignments and others that were so short they could have been a tweet. Or what do they now call them if they're not a tweet on what was Twitter? As always, there were a few reviews that were filled with spoilers that I don't want to give you. So I picked one that gives away little but still says quite a lot. Karina gave the book five stars and enjoyed everything about it, especially the characters. She said, This book was not what I thought it was going to be in a delightfully unexpected way. It is full of humour and mischief. Our protagonist, Lady Ching, is a fiery, quick-tempered, half-vampire demon and half-holy Ching fox spirit. She was traded by her mother to the King of Hell when she was young and is now living in immortal Shanghai, running menial errands for the king. The book centres around her journey to seek the truth about a plot to steal a highly coveted dragon pearl from the king. Through her adventures, she finds friendship, love and herself. To me, this book was a cosy fantasy with low stakes. You will love the story if you're a fan of the found family trope. I enjoyed reading Jing's character journey and felt she had a lot of growth from the beginning to the end. She also has a unique voice and says a lot of quirky things that may not be to everyone's taste, but I liked it. The love story was unexpected and endearing, and I loved the friendship she formed with the character of Gigi. I don't have much to critique, if anything. I would say that this book came off to me more in the YA genre, but this could just be Ching's character quirks giving off that energy. I also thought the ending, while satisfying, felt a little abrupt and I was left wanting more, so hopefully there's a sequel. Other than that, I didn't have much to critique and enjoyed my reading experience. As always, though I like to go into a new book with an open mind, I do really enjoy looking at other people's reviews after I've finished reading. Sometimes they would point out something that was niggling at me as I was reading the book and clear up the thought that I was already having. And others, I will 100% disagree with what they're saying because I personally felt very differently. Of course, everyone is different. And when we pick up a book, we're not necessarily looking for the same thing as the next person at the table. Books can be everything from an escape to an education, and I have definitely read books that meet both of those criteria in the last month. As we can't see into the heads of those who have written the reviews that we find across various platforms, we truly can't know what they're thinking when they read that book, what made them pick it up, or even what the mood was when they finally finished it or put it away unread. Though some reviews may contain similar views or opinions, it makes sense that they aren't all exactly the same, wherever you're looking. It doesn't matter what platforms you've visited or who you've chatted with, take every review with a generous pinch of salt. Trust your friends or people you know have enjoyed the same books as you before, and then look at the overall score and take it as read if a book is for you or not. Anyway, now I've told you about other people's views, let's get down to it. Here are my thoughts on Shanghai Immortal by A.Y. Chow. Completely spoiler-free and 100% honest. Did I like the book? This last year, I have found myself turning to fantasy more and more often, though there are some I am still just looking at and occasionally contemplating, I find some books more palatable and much easier to read than others. Here's here's an admission that's probably going to get me banned from the romanticy boards everywhere. I have now hidden my collection of Sarah J Mass on the bottom shelf of my library so they don't keep on giving me the evil eye. Yeah, A Court of Mist and, Fro- uh, Court of Mist and Fury is still 50% unfinished after six months. I have loved tales of vampires since I was a teenager. Salem's Lot, The Lost Boys, Dracula, there's something dark and mysterious about them. 
When it comes to Shanghai Immortal, I am not afraid to say that I have some hugely conflicted feelings. While I really enjoyed the story and loved a great many of the characters, there were a few things that grated on me just a little bit. However, because I liked the story enough, I was able to find some kind of justifications for a number of the things that would have otherwise caused me to put the book down and only reluctantly pick it up again. I'm getting better at DNFing books now. You won't find them on my Goodreads because I don't mark them as anything. They are kind of a half-hearted, I started it and eventually I might finish it thing. Lady Ching was admittedly a rather childish character who had behaviours that were hugely unbecoming for someone of her high status. Spitting on people, taking joy in flashing and running away from confrontations or situations she found uncomfortable. They're all actions that are both incredibly childish and pretty disgusting when you think about it carefully. She does all of these things and more, choosing to show disrespect to people who could be seen as trying to help her. The nicknames she has for the people who have brought her up and trained her in a way that has given her the tools to function in polite society, as well as defend herself in a physical altercation, are decidedly childish. Horsey, for example, is probably not the nicest to her, but as she later discovers, he is actually incredibly proud of her abilities and everything she has accomplished. And though he doesn't tell her, and probably, possibly, could, he makes others aware of the fact that she is both bright and skilled. The insults she flings around with regularity could be seen as incredibly juvenile, piss fart, tartars and turd eggs. However, it's also possible that this is more an issue with translation than anything else, despite the fact that the author is Chinese-Canadian. The insults and curse words could have a very different meaning in Chinese than they do in English and therefore have more impact. As I don't speak Chinese, I cannot comment. But if anyone out there listening does know, I would really love to find out. So get in touch to teach me. I want to learn. I will admit that Lady Ching's behaviour, especially when talking to Lord Wang, was occasionally annoying. She clearly knows her own mind and thinks she knows better than her elders. A number of reviews mention how they felt she was behaving immaturely and citing her age as a reason to know better. And granted, if she were a 99-year-old mortal, then she would. But Ching is a 99-year-old immortal. And by that logic, she is still very much a child. She may well have some responsibilities, but when you consider how she is treated by her guardian and those who have taken it upon themselves to teach her court etiquette, fighting and the arts, she is still thought of as very young. There are several mentions of her coming of age when she reaches 100 on her next birthday. She has been kept in the dark about a lot of her birthright, knowing little of her mother apart from that she was sold for the price of a canary diamond and that her father was a vampire. She believes herself to be unloved and unlovable, and more importantly, unwanted. And for that reason alone, she is something of a rebel. If no one cares, then why should she? Granted, this is not exactly a great justification for her behaviour overall, but it does go some way to perhaps explain some of it. In Shanghai Immortal, Jing is suddenly flung into an unfamiliar world where she is forced to constantly battle against her vampire side in order to resist the tasty mortals who are constantly in her path. She is also seemingly confused by the mortal who has been tasked with keeping her company, Tony Lee, who is baffling when it comes to his behaviour with her. He blows hot and cold, keeping his distance, while at the same time showing her little kindnesses that she has never before experienced, such as introducing her to Tootsie Rolls and sharing a meal with her at sunset. He makes an effort to get to know her as a person and opens her mind and her eyes to the reality that she isn't and never really has been alone. The relationship that builds between Mr. Lee and Lady Jing is actually sweet, which is another reason why I would probably put this book in the YA camp of fantasy. They are like a couple of young teenage lovebirds who have never encountered romance before, 
And it's such a slow burn that it almost, but not quite, puts Mariana Zapata's When Gracie Met the Grump to shame. That particular book gives the definition of slow burn a whole other meaning. While something is developing between Mr. Lee and Ching, she is also discovering that people she thought merely tolerated her were actually trying to be her friends. Lady G, or Gigi, as she is affectionately referred to, is incredible. She is definitely the light relief, but she also has depth to her. All the while, Ching has believed that every interaction between her and the daughter of the Jade Emperor was merely polite antagonism. The older Celestial has been showing her friendship. Jing is so used to being tolerated that she has no idea what real friendship looks like, and therefore it's a great surprise to her when Gigi turns up in Shanghai and behaves as though they are more than acquaintances. This show of bonding between them is truly heartwarming, and when Ching realises that there is more between them than simple politeness, she starts to open up to the possibility that she is more than people have made her believe her entire life. She begins to grow into her potential and really see what was there all along. For me, it's these realisations that made the book so enjoyable. Ching's joy and her growth are the highlights of the story. Will I read anything else by A.Y. Chow? Being honest, I am not sure that this book actually needs a sequel. Yeah, I know that some of the reviews have said it ended sort of abruptly, but I liked that. Shanghai Immortal was something of a building's romance and Lady Ching discovered who she was. So do we need more? That's not to say that I won't pick the sequel up and read it, but I would like to see the main character continue to grow and build on the development that she has already shown us rather than go backwards. I say this from disappointed experience, unfortunately. There have been so many books where the first one was all that was needed and in the second book the protagonist not only has to battle the same demons again, but also loses a lot of the development they achieved in the first instalment. Oh well, I guess I'll have to wait and see what happens with the next one, but fingers crossed for this. If you're looking for something like this, or you loved this and want something else, then you'll love these. This is the first Chinese-based mythological fantasy I have actually read. Though that's not to say I don't own a fair few of them. They just happen to be sitting firmly under a pile of books on my considerable TBR. So take a walk with me around my growing library, which is now half a wall in my bedroom or my studio, And let's see what I can find. It seems that I actually have more than I thought, starting with Six Crimson Cranes and Her Radiant Curse by Elizabeth Lim. The latter has only just been released and I have a beautiful special edition from Waterstones with the most gorgeous pastel sprayed edges. I got And Break the Pretty Kings by Lena Zhong as part of my Locked Library subscription another great book subscription that I've actually had for a while. This is a stunning edition with a vibrant cover in a mix of gold and bright jewel tones. A Song of Silver Flame Like Night by Amelie Wen Zhao is another special edition that I got from Waterstones. What can I say? I loved sprayed edges and pretty covers. This is another book about dragons and magic and also another that I have yet to read. Surprise, but it does look good on the shelf. Early last week, I was part of a book tour for the second in the Radiant Empire duology by Shelley Parker Chan. And though these books are probably closer to historical fantasy than Shanghai Immortal, both She Who Became the Sun and He Who Drowned the World do have a mystical and magical undertone. I can't believe we are already in September. I'm not sure where the summer vanished to, though I do think it was probably a week back in June. That said, the year is going way too fast and it's actually a little scary, especially when you consider Christmas decorations are already starting to appear in shop windows. It's too soon, way too soon. Though I swore I wasn't going to do this, in fact I even talked about it in my last episode, 
I am actually putting myself on a temporary book buying ban as I work my way through the rather, rather large pile that has built on my shelves over the last few months. Instead of reading the books on my shelves, I have just been buying more. I guess that's the curse of the mood reader. I buy on impulse and just stack them up high in the hopes that one of them will appeal to me at any given moment. I do have a few pre-orders and, of course, my book subscriptions, which will hopefully keep the book dragon at bay for a while. But I am going to still build myself a list of the books I want to buy or put on my Christmas list for my family to furnish me with in the interim. All of that to say that if you have any recommendations, don't be shy. Still send them on over. So... Maybe it's a sci-fi author or light-hearted romance you think I really need to try out. Email me at beingbookishpod at gmail.com or DM me on Instagram or the site formerly known as Twitter and I will be sure to add those to my ever-growing list. Don't forget, if you want to hear about new releases and other books I've read and keep up with my reviews, you can sign up for my newsletter on my website, beingbookish.co.uk. For everyone who is subscribed, thank you so much for your patience. I will be sending out the first newsletter in a while this week. I know that I keep on saying this. However, my life has been a tad hectic of late and there's been a lot going on that I have no control over, mostly because it's affecting me, but it isn't me. I am hoping that things will start to settle down just a little bit very soon so other things have the chance to get back on track. Well, that's it for this week and thank you so much for listening. If you like what you hear, why not share it with your friends and family? And please post a star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or any of the other podcatchers where you listen. Those reviews and ratings really help. You can follow me on Instagram and threads as Being Bookish Pod, on TikTok as Being Bookish Reviews, and on X, which still the email subtitle as formerly Twitter, as Being underscore Bookish. Or you can check out my website for the podcast back catalogue and full written spoiler free book reviews at beingbookish.co.uk. Well, I've got a lot to get ready for next week and another new book arrived the day before yesterday, way before I started my book buying ban. So until next time, this is me saying farewell. Farewell.